everybody. Welcome to the Online Wine Tasting Club. How are you doing, Alex? It's, it's terrible, Jamie. I don't know what to say. I, I got my Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I checked to my Kirkus Albel Reliolis, and that meant the Norris Opper knife produced too many trimethyl hydride and ethylene chlorines. And it's a lot harder than making mobile phones. Easy for you to say. Welcome to the Discoverer did I, did series. I, mention I went to South Africa, got my honeymoon. Absolutely. Um, anyway, yes. the line is tonight we're here for Sovereigns of the World. It's not Jamie and Alex, you probably, it's Caroline and Lee. It's very difficult to tell. But <laughs> yeah, I know, it's uncanny. We couldn't um, resist the opportunity to um, tease them slightly. So, boys, wherever you're watching this, hello. Was that a um, P45? <laughs> the, 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 um, and I, I hope you're not too cross with us teasing you. Look, Jamie, I even got your Flint Vineyard cap. Um, so, yes, welcome to Savings of the World. Um, you've got some guest hosts tonight. I hope we do you proud. I hope you enjoy the evening. Um, I am absolutely delighted to have Lee, the lovely Lee Isaacs, next to me um, doing the guest hosting tonight. He's an absolute gem and um, his knowledge is as encyclopedic as Jamie's, if not greater, but I can't say that out loud. The, Don't the tell him I said that. The bar higher and higher. <laughs> only going to go one name for me at the end of the evening. <laughs> so thank you. Very kind. So tonight what we're doing is we're tasting two great varieties from three different countries around the world. And the whole point of doing this is so that we can really focus in on one white grape and one red grape and see how they differ across the world, see how climate, country, soil, all of those things that we talk about um, at length uh, affects the, the flavors that we taste um, in our glasses. So without further ado, should we go to the introduction video? Um, pour wines one to three in your glass because we're going to do um, a side by side tasting um, and we are going to go to the introduction video so you can start to understand what tonight's all going to be about. When I come to write a script for a Wines of Spain type video, it's pretty easy to do. You talk a little about the country's geography, history and the key wine regions and styles. But for this one, Jamie has thrown a bit of a curveball. On paper, of course, this is an exploration of the Sauvignon family and two of the most popular grapes in the world of wine, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon. However, there's something much more interesting to talk about. We touched on it in the adventure series Indigenous Grapes and it's all about that link between wine and place. Now today we are looking at two grapes, but we're doing it from three very different perspectives. Firstly, France, where these grapes have been evolving for centuries. Secondly, the sunny but high environments of Southern America. And thirdly, all the way down under to Australia and New Zealand. What better chance do we have to look side by side at the impact that these different countries can have on the same grapes? Wine geeks often talk in an abstract way about how different climates and soils of different regions can affect the end product. Well, here they are in three glasses right next to you. So what we're going to do tonight is to go into the actual tasting experience to highlight which of the flavours you can find in the wine which have come from that country and its different expressions of the grape. And that's quite fun. Before we start though, a very high level introduction to the Sauvignon family. Now, the vast majority of today's wine grapes start with Tramina as their ancestor. Over time, a grape called Sauvignon emerged, and that is one of the parents of Sauvignon Blanc. Now, this gets very confusing when you realise that Sauvignon is pronounced Sauvignon in many parts of the world. When the legendary winemaker Robert Mondavi made it popular in the US, he decided the pronunciation might be a little too much, so he called the wine Fumé Blanc, taking inspiration from Prefumé, a French wine made from Sauvignon Blanc. Now, Sauvignon is most famously found in Jura in France, and the root of that name is Sauvage, meaning wild, but we don't know much about the other ancestors. All we know is that Sauvignon Blanc most likely emerged in Bordeaux, where it is blended with Sémillon to make their delicious white and dessert wines but it was in the Loire Valley where it was allowed to have the starring role, powering not just Puy Fumé, but Sancerre and many other famous wines. It was definitely in Bordeaux where Cabernet Sauvignon was created, and we know a bit more about this. 
Merlot is the most commonly planted grape in Bordeaux, and that evolved into Cabernet Franc. In 1997, DNA testing proved that Cabernet Sauvignon is a cross between Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. It's perhaps not a surprise that two such delicious grape varieties should create a child with such quality. So, France is the home of both Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon. Sauvignon Blanc is one of the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon, and both of them are famous grapes from Bordeaux. Got it? Good! So let's have a look briefly at Bordeaux. It's in the south of the country, so it's warm. But it's also on a massive river, the Garonne. And it's very the Atlantic, so sea breezes come in to cool grapes. And that water has a massive influence on the wines. Sauvignon from the River Loire Valley has a similar effect, but the heat's a little less extreme being further north. In contrast, our South American wines come from Chile, a whacking 11,000 kilometers from France, which means that for starters, they're in the Southern Hemisphere, which means the hot part of the year is in our winter. The grapes don't really know where they are though, they're just on a yearly cycle, so they develop in a very similar way. What is different is their latitude. Being located even closer to the equator than the Bordeaux grapes means they get a lot of sunshine. Bordeaux is also very low. The Andes, however, are not. The higher you get, the cooler you get, so it all kind of balances out. But there's a bit more ultraviolet light, which thickens up and colours the skins of the grapes. New Zealand is quite different again. It's perhaps closer to France in its climate and maybe a bit cooler. Definitely a bit hillier than Bordeaux, which is pretty much flat. But it's maybe even more influenced by the sea than France's, being island-based. And Australia has its own whole thing going on. Jamie will tell you all about that, and of course we love it. Now the Sauvignon Blancs that we get from New Zealand tend to be on the north end of the South Island. However, they're also very good scientists in New Zealand, and much work has been done to work out how to make delicious wines that everybody loves. And that culture of science has introduced a whole new element to winemaking, much more so than the traditional approaches of Bordeaux. So, three environments, three different cultures, and three very different styles. Question is, which ones would you prefer? And there's no right or wrong answers here. So let's go back to the studio and see what you think. So, I think Sauvignon Blanc, right, I think there's this really interesting thing about it. So 1968, yep. it was France's 20th most planted grape. Okay. So it was really low down the pecking order everywhere, even though yep. it's now sort of like, you know, it's really broadly planted in Bordeaux and so on and so forth. So it was 1968. 20 years later, it was their fourth most planted. Wow. So we're talking 20 years later, 1988. So New Zealand's had time to have an impact. And New Zealand, obviously we can taste New Zealand, Sauvignon Blanc in a moment, but that made such an impact so quickly. And we look at I think it's really interesting wine to look at how different countries affect whatever river else does. Yeah. So in Argentina, God, everywhere is growing Malbec now because of Argentina. Look at the success of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. And it was only first planted in New Zealand in, in Marlborough in the early 70s. Uh, no, yeah, 1973, in fact. There we go. And it became, in fact, Hugh Johnson, when he first wrote about it in the first edition of the Wine Atlas, New Zealand got one paragraph, one whole paragraph. And it said something along the lines of the wines are tasty, it will never amount to much. Now it's okay. got a massive wait for it in the latest edition six pages we haven't got any pages no but with that, this is what we have to aspire but, to but we will eventually eventually eventually, eventually. so you, you look at that success in New Zealand so Blanc and how it's impacted everywhere else and you know as we saw that it's everywhere it is everywhere um it well it's definitely here tonight so that difference between 1968 and 1988 that you said it's primarily planted in Bordeaux Mm -hmm. um, and Bordeaux blends are Sauvignon, Sauvignon, mm -hmm. but it's a king on its own in the Loire Valley, which is what we're starting with tonight. Yes. So did that huge growth in plantation come within those two regions or did it go down into South France or other regions as well? So there was an impact in other regions. So firstly, we saw an impact. There was an impact in Bordeaux in, in, in moving towards an increase of dry wines. Yeah. So throughout the sort of in the seventies, we drank a lot of sweet wines in the UK. Yeah, which were largely semillon based. Largely semillon based. But we've seen partially as a, a, a response to climate change, 
we're seeing a little bit more Sauvignon Blanc. It, it copes a bit more with the climate and it's that freshness. So consumers, mm. and we're saying this is a very long-term view, consumers want a bit more freshness mm. in their wine. So maybe that's sometimes lower alcohol, which you might see with the Cabernet, but it's also with that freshness of acidity that we see with something like Sauvignon Blanc. And that's, you know, what every great variety has a distinguishing mark. And I think th there are other white varieties that have great acidity, but Sauvignon Blanc, is that's its yep. character. It has to be fresh, has to be clean. So growth it, in Bordeaux, growth in the wild, the South of France, as you identified, yeah. that's where it, like it's just an explosion of grapes in the south. The south of France is France is Australia. That's their place to okay. experiment. So they can go things. they can go mad in a very French reserved, they, they, controlled they, kind of way. Yes, they have they have rules, but there are fewer rules. And yeah. a little bit more, obligatoire. Set obligatoire. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll, no, I'm not gonna do that. Maybe we'll put a screw cap on this. <laughs> oh now hold your horses. Let's not go completely Easy. mad. Easy. Um in fact the terrain is the only one with a cork. Was, yes. oh, oh no, there was another one. Well, interestingly, two it's French, French for cork. Cork. screw cap for wine. Oh. Yeah. Bought by then by a company in Australia called Stelvin. Yes. Which is why we call it. But anyway, anyway we Stelvin, haven't we actually tasted any wine. wine. Um so terrain, the first wine from tonight comes from terrain um in the Loire Valley. And terrain, I'm guessing, from quantity of Sauvignon produced is the most important region, but it's not where the real superstars are because that's more Minitou Salon, Sorcerre. Correct. Correct. So if you look at the, the Loire is the third largest production in terms of volume of liquid area of France. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have Bordeaux, Rhone and Loire in, in volume um, of, of liquid. And the river obviously starts in the central massif and south flows north toward Orléans and then heads mm -hmm. never each heads west I always have to do that never each other yep. and then heads west to, to Nantes so if, if you look at the, the region that is uh Turenne, it's kind of bang in the middle of that east west yes. stretch right so you've got Nantes and then you've got Sancerre which yep. is you know as you say Monitou Salon, Sancerre, Poit Fumé it, it kind of sits right in the middle of that so it's about 150 miles both ways out mm. to, to Nantes and out to Sancerre so there's huge growth there and I think where Turenne has been really successful is it doesn't have the powerhouse name that Sans Airport, if you may mention mm. so on and so, so, and so, forth, so forth, have. So it can make wines at a slightly, slightly cheaper price. Yes. Because it's almost like paying for a name of something, you pay more for it. Oh, I Which do. is why I buy these shirts from unknown brands, because then they don't charge me. As a dear friend of mine once said to me many moons ago, you don't need to follow fashion, Caroline. You've got to style all of it your own. Which I took as a huge insult that, at the one, time. But... One way of putting it, yeah. that's not what the judge told me. I'm not allowed to, I'm not, not allowed to talk about that. But to then, you know, being a central bit, and it, it's quite productive, quite fertile soils compared to other parts. Sancerre, obviously, you want to keep it really small and selective, so you mm. have increase plantings and yields are a bit lower there than they are in Terrain. So to, I've heard Terrain referred to as sort of like, I don't like this term, so I've reticence about using it, but sort of poor man's Sancerre. And I, I think that's yeah. wholly unfair to use that. It, it is, anywhere. but I love a I love a cheeky shortcut. I love a, a little nugget, a yeah. bit of a tip. So, I always like to go to some really great Cote de village mm -hmm. instead of Gigonda or yeah. Chateau Neuf. And I think um, this wine um, is from a really great producer, um, the Domaine de Corbière, and it's managed by a husband and wife team. Now it's been in the family since the nineteen sixties. And this is, but I, I can't, I don't know how to describe it. It's Osley, Wesley, or Wesley. I think if there are um, any French speak, I yeah, learned to speak French. I'm really John sorry. Cleese language school, so <laughs> that tells you an awful lot. Um, Wesley, uh, it's like southish facing. Yeah, and it's to the very east of the terrain region. Mm -hmm. So you're heading towards slightly warmer climate. Yeah. So you are getting that riper fruit profile. Um, and and I love thinking, well, I you know, this is the most Sancerre in style you can get without paying Sancerre money. And yeah. and I love tips like that. I think it's brilliant. Oh, usually we're all looking like that. You, you know, you mentioned instead of Chateauneuf de Crap, you've got Sacquera, <laughs> for example. Um, that wasn't a Freudian slip, that was intentional. Um, <laughs> it's all part of the act, you see. Uh, so what you've got in Sancerre, you've got that, that lovely kind of um, sort of chalky, minerally soil. Yeah. We, we get very caught up on the soil, especially in France. It's the concept of terroir. I remember once a conversation between a French vigneron and an Australian winemaker and having this argument about who made the best wines. And the French vigneron said, well, how can you make the best wines? There's not even a direct translation for the word terroir in English, to which the Australian winemaker just said, well, I know what souffle is. I kind of dropped the mic and walked away. But you've got that, that lovely kind of chalky, minerally soil in Sancerre, and that's yeah. apparently where Sancerre gets all its quality from. 
over in Turin, so yeah, about 100 for 150 miles further west, you've got this tufaceous soil. So it's like a really soft kind of porous limestone. I don't know I'm doing that. That's uh, international sign language for soft, soft. porous limestone yeah. specific. So if you're I've got what you're talking about. And you need some of that. They'll know soft porous limestone, uh, which was laid down 90 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. By who? So I, th I think, well, like, rumor has it with Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and they wouldn't sign off Cretaceous Park. It said a film about soil isn't going to be that exciting. Oh, so they. Wow. He's obviously not into park. wine. Not at all. But it's all these little like marine animals, that's sort of what limestone is. But it's that real soft soil, they call it tufo. And it just gives the wines that, I think you get that slight, hold on, try. I think you get that slightly mineral. You do. Thing that we look forward Huge to minerality on it. Um, uh, fun fact. Um, all facts the, are fun, Carol. Oh, I know. Um, especially when they're about soil. But the tufo soil um, was quarried to the hilt to build the big chateaus in the Loire Valley. And what was left was some wonderful caves for winemaking and yeah. cellars. And so that's, that's what like they're this, used this for. This concept of terroir might actually be accurate. But wow, well, yeah, no. Yeah, no, we, we don't want to play rich. any um, um But the other thing about this wine, um, and please, I'll just interject, please do put your tasting notes um, in our lovely PowerPoint, um, you've got the joining details there. It should be in your tasting notes, towtc.co.uk slash taste, or you can join at slido.com with that code that's on screen there. Um, let us know what you're tasting because we deliberately don't go into huge detail about what you should be tasting because we believe wine is very subjective and everybody gets something slightly different. Um, but the other really important thing about this is that it's sur lit, mm. which is normally something you see on a muscadet from Loire. It is indeed. It is indeed. Um, and this is one of <laughs> Alex's favourite topics, I know. Um, so I, I, I feel the need to get, obviously I parodied Alex. Really effectively, everybody when they started watching the show went, oh my word, it's actually <laughs> Alex. He's had his hair done by Lego. Um, <laughs> we, uh, Alex notoriously gets a bit technical. So. Lees contact uh, using using leaving the dead lees in the wine after fermentation. So it's the dead yeast after fermentation. We really associate that with kind of high quality Chardonnay. We especially associate it with Champagne, and we kind of forget that other places do it with other varieties. Obviously, as you say, Muscadet Sarly, which is further west in Loire, as, as we've discussed. But you can do it with lots of other varieties. Now, we traditionally think of Sauvignon Blanc as being really kind of pure mineral, shoots through the palate. That's mm. it. Adding a bit of lees gives you that bit of extra texture i think and a little bit of weight but you have to be careful with leaves caroline I, can you I, not I don't mean <laughs> you have to be careful all with of the leaves because they've let me well they've let me out for tonight <laughs> but you have to be careful with leaves because leaves produce a little bit of sulfur in the wine oh that's the stinky and egg stuff it's the stinky egg stuff now that can react with some substances in the wine and create what are called thiols dun, dun, dun. now they're um, really strong and pungently flavored and can, yeah often give you unpleasant flavours, so you can be really careful. And they're really, um, when you talk about Sauvignon Blanc, you'll hear wine geeks like us mention thiols a lot, yeah. won't you? If you're playing wine geek bingo, I mean, you've probably passed by and you've probably won by now, um, but we'll talk a lot about thiols. Now, where thiols, kind of where I wanted to get to, so I've kind of taken what you're talking about and railroaded it, because that's what people do. That's fine. I'll try and gently bring you back yeah, occasionally. Please, if you can, if you can. Thiols, it's believed, are responsible for probably Sauvignon Blanc's most famous tasting note. Cat's pee on a gooseberry brush. On a gooseberry brush. Now, what I'd like to say is I don't have a frame of reference for that. <laughs> I have a cat. Uh, I let it, it goes out. Do you have a gooseberry bush? Business. I don't have a gooseberry bush, but I've been in the vicinity of a gooseberry bush. So okay. I've smelled a gooseberry bush. Yeah. But I've not, look, I don't have a lot of time, right? I, I've not got my cat to kind of attached it to the gooseberry well, bush. I think your dedication to it. tasting notes is, you I'm know, like maybe pebbles. not quite there. I've licked pebbles out of stream. <laughs> <laughs> the inside of a back but anyway um cat's pee on a gooseberry bush and that, i think we probably associate that a bit more with new zealand but it it's sauvignon's most famous tasting mm. note, i think um and i think what it's trying to get at is that freshness that zest that zip and that gooseberry thing so i i i've been in the wine trade far too long um i not once have smelt cat's pee on a gooseberry bush but again maybe i don't have the right frame of reference as you i think um as some clever marketer, you know, um, took that and put oh, yeah. it on a label oh, yeah, sometimes. Somebody that worked in marketing. A wine marketing, yes, I know, we're absolute devils. Um, but 
yeah, I you can definitely get that slight creaminess coming through yeah. from the least contact, can't you? It, it, it definitely it softens it ever so slightly on the palate. So I think this for me this still has that zest and that zip, mm. but it's just it's slightly fuller and it's slightly softer yeah. and creamier. And I, mm. I think where Sauvignon gets really interesting, if we look at it, you know, globally as a market. There's a very specific style of Sauvignon Blanc that sells, and that's driven by what New Zealand do. And this is sort of very broadly generalizing things. But where Sauvignon gets really exciting is when you have wine producers say, so I'm just going to do something slightly different with it, whether it's a little bit of leaves, a little bit of oak, just something like that to, mm. just, to just add a point of difference. Yeah. And, and for me, yeah, that, that I, I get all the classic characters, I think it's quite drastic, quite citrusy, but that little bit of creamy texture in the palate, I think that's absolutely wonderful. Um, I think it's all absolutely beautiful example of a terrain Sauvignon and and yes you know you don't always have to go up to the really punchy prices of um Sancerre um so well done Jamie great choice thumbs up what do people at home think um let's have a look I'm leaning forward to anybody watching I'm leaning forward yeah to we're the, we're, uh... we're old and blind um so quite lemony acidic it's so acidic. yes yep. you I mean that's a characteristic of Sauvignon Blanc it's always quite high apple. on acidity I, I, I like apple I've got like right on the finish I've got mm. I've got the real apple thing uh hint of salty I like that yeah. salty saline mineral it's all coming yeah. from the same origin whether it's salty or mineral or yep. chalky or whatever which are, it's all the same origin point uh crisp we like that somebody's put a pic how do you put pictures on that that's genius yeah no very clever very, people very clever. Somebody said, oh there's a badger there's a badger there oh look badger. here's a badger hi badgers are here gooseberry um, yeah and again gooseberry yeah cats going gooseberry bush. very classic tasting someone's so. actually just written badger as well i d yeah. don't get any notes of badger on this wine but well done again no frame of reference again, somebody's <laughs> written the elderflower i like that again that's quite a classic so we, we think of it particularly in Sunset, I suppose we'll talk a little bit about climate mentioned soil. You know, is it, 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 this is a cool region. We're in sort of northwestern France. So you, you get that cooler expression of it. So it has more nervosity. It has more of that floral. Aroma. We talk about Sauvignon Blanc being uh, a, an aromatic variety. And sometimes, you know, I like aromatic varieties. So I like Pinot Gris. I like Riesling because yeah. I'm in the wine trade. If anybody in the wine trade doesn't like Riesling, get out. Well, no, um, you're not allowed to join. To, you, yeah. That, that's yeah, the first thing. It's the rules. Um, you know, I like those aromatic, right? And sometimes for me, Sauvignon doesn't do the same type of aromatic. But when you get it at, that, at its purest, it's more the elderflower and white flower and soft mm. thing rather than that kind of big honeyed and blossom style. Yeah. And I think this is kind of getting towards us. So I like I like the elderflower. Note yeah, well. absolutely. Um, shall we move on to wine number two then? Our first comparison. Um, so that we couldn't do a Sauvignon blog tasting without doing. A Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, which is, as you quite rightly said, Lee, at the beginning, it's what has blown Sauvignon up yeah. globally. Yeah. Um, and I think it's fair to say, with my wine marketing hat on, that all the New Zealand types got super excited about how popular Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc was and how much money it could make them and planted as much as they possibly could at one time. And there's it's kind of flooded the shelves, so, hasn't so, it? So that's a really interesting point. Um, if, if we, I, I'm going to step back ever so slightly. If we look at Australia, so Australia had huge success with Chardonnay and Shiraz, right? And then Australia just went, great, Chardonnay and Shiraz planted everywhere um, in an Australian accent. I don't know where that guy was from. They planted <laughs> Chardonnay everywhere. And then eventually got to a point where we can't move this. So it flooded the shelves, but it stopped moving. People stopped buying it. New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, as you said, first planted there in 73 in Marlborough by Montana. Yeah. Uh, by Serbo, there was Serbo Croat, and Montana means mountain in Serbo Croat because it's quite actually quite a mountainous region. Um, Marlborough. It's very hilly. It's not it's not a flat, flat place at all, so obviously by the sea. Um, but you've got sort of mountainous terrain. Yeah, you've got the Nelson, is it the Nelson Range of Mountains towards yes, the north? Yeah, yeah. And then you, it's two sides surrounded by coast. Look, yeah, we're, we're doing silent rain. Yeah, big box, music. little box. Um, but you've got Wairau <laughs> at the top of Marlborough. That's right. Uh, and then Central, and then um, you've got Awateri. And, and this is a mixture of fruit from, from both regions. Awateri uh, is cooler further south, but you're in New Zealand, so that's why it makes yeah. sense. And that's where you get the kind of crisp from. Um, anyway, Sauvignon Blanc was planted in, in Marlborough, first of commercial releases late 70s makes it big everybody starts drinking it we all start drinking it it's now massive so new zealand has 41,600 hectares planted of which 67 percent is sauvignon blanc wow. 71 percent of 
planting area is in Marlborough. So using maths, which I didn't invent, but I'm aware of, 54% of total New Zealand area is Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Wow. It's massive. And Sauvignon Blanc is 80% of total New Zealand exports. Yes. It's so huge. It, it is to New Zealand what something else is to another Ray region. Was to <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> it causes no, the, to the, Newcastle. relevant humour. Anyway, um, well, so, so this took off and it's massive yeah. and it's still massive. By value sales, it's the UK's favourite white wine. But I have bad news for you. Are you I was going to say you're sitting down. I can see you're sitting down. Yeah, I am sitting 2021, down. 2021 uh they've started harvesting now where are we april now so they'll be, they'll be pretty much finished coming the to harvest. the end of it but obviously we haven't got the stats on the 2022 harvest the the the, the, the word is that it's pretty good it's pretty decent but 2021 okay. was the last harvest we had and they only harvested 370,000 tons which sounds like a lot but that was 19 percent down on the previous year so there's actually a shortage of new zealand so there years. is um and and not helped by various geopolitical yes. economic yes. situations um, of which we're not going to mention because when we're, we're a wine show um but um it, yeah so the wine we're tasting is a 2021 mm -hmm. um and vintage. it was a, it was a tough vintage, vintage because yeah. the spring was a little bit all over the place yeah. which meant that there weren't enough buds on the vine which meant that there wasn't the usual amount of grapes yeah. that Cold, came from the buds however from spring onwards, it was fairly decent. Yeah. So the fruit that was there ripened beautifully, yeah. um, but there just wasn't quite as much so as I was, normal. I was with, I was very lucky to be with Nick Koenig, um, who's the winemaker for Villa Maria, just, just before the harvest. So I would have been with him early February 2021, whenever it was. And it was saying, like, you know, I can't, anyway, whenever it was, I was talking to him and it was, you know, quality is looking really good, which is a very classic wine thing. Oh, we've made less of it, but it's very good. It's yeah. very Bordeaux. It is the best vintage we have. Ever yeah. Seen. Are you sure about that? Mm. Um, but quality is good. There was just less of it. So where you see that Marlborough thing at the premium end of Marlborough Sauvignon, relatively unaffected yields was sort of okay because it's premium, but it sells less. It was the bulk juice that, that yeah. really struggled. But it was a tough vintage. But I think if you have producers, you know, we, we were a bit reductionist when it comes to vintage, I think. We, we simply forgot it was a good vintage, it was a bad vintage. Well, vintage is reliant on the other vintages around it. So what's come before, what's going afterwards. But if you're a good wine producer, if you're a good grower and a good winemaker, you can still make good wine. And make of course you can, because it's, and this is where craft and art meet science. Indeed. Um, and you can take fruit and make something amazing from it. Um, at the mainstream sort of commercial end, it's made to a recipe largely. Yeah. Um, a, flavor led recipe yeah. um so this one as you quite rightly said it's a blend of grapes from two slightly different regions within marlborough so one from the wairu yeah. and one from the arutari and um, wairu is slightly um produces slightly punchier riper fruits yes yeah. and um arutari is brings so in that minerality the and the yeah herbaceousness. and it, it, whilst we normally think because we're northern hemisphere you go if you go further south it gets hotter of course we're in new zealand so we're in the southern hemisphere so if you go further south it gets cooler now you're not talking you're still within marlborough but our terry ranges from kind of the ocean to a mountain range over in the west again west of every yeah over in the west so you do get a slightly cooler crisper mineral herbaceous style yeah you get that wire valley gives you really punchy that that kind of thing that we expect to serve on blanc so we've mentioned you know citrus and cat's pea and the gooseberry bush and that but where Sauvignon really succeeds in New Zealand, despite it being a more moderate climate, is that acid. So the acid takes a long time to fall off in the vines. So you can leave it on the vine for longer. Right. Which develops riper fruit. Yeah. So this is why with Kiwi Sauvignon, you can kind of get that big passion fruit and tropical fruit and melon and mango and all those kind of terms in what is relatively speaking more moderate climate it's, it's the acid that allows it to stay on the vine for a yeah. really long time it's so different to the terrain so different I, I was literally just about to say that and you know having said a, a short while ago that we don't talk about what we taste um what i love about this format of tasting is that it's the same grape variety in three yeah. different glasses the first one yes it was full of citrusy minerality 
um, a slight creaminess from the leaves. But this one, there's so much more tropical fruit coming through on it, and that's what people at home are getting as well. But you do still get that lovely acidity and some yeah. minerality yeah. from the cooler climate fruit, which is amazing. Now I'm going to confess something to you. Um, are we are we ready? Yeah. Um, I've gone off Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc in recent years because it just got too, I know, it got too, you know, acidic. It got yeah. too dry. It got just too sharp for me personally, and it is all subjective. However, I think the expression of tropical fruit that comes through on that to balance out that acidity is really lovely. I totally agree. Uh, I must confess also. Right. Drank loads of Sauvignon Blanc from yeah. all different places, not from New Zealand. And for me, it was just a case of I, I've drunk so much of that now. Mm. I kind of want to drink something else. But I, I, I think you raised a point, which I'd not really thought about before, is like the big brand stuff being made to recipe gets a bit drier, gets mm. a bit crisper. And we like yep. that. We like that. That's the, the kind of we have national palates, don't we? Right. So Absolutely. we say kind of like the, the British palate is quite austere and dry and traditional. And the American palate is big and broad and bulky. And the Australian palate is lager. Um, but <laughs> making it to kind of appeal to that sort of dry, more austere palate. But whilst this is lovely and dry, I get the feeling there's something else underneath it. But it's that big punch of fruit. But this is where New Zealand also made a difference with Sauvignon Blanc. So we said at the start, you know, the success of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and the popularity of it drove other countries to look at it and look at what they were doing with it. They kind of pioneered something. So Sauvignon Blancs are actually quite difficult to grow. It's, it's very vigorous. It's very vegetative. Mm -hmm. uh, economically, yields are kind of quite patchy. So you need low, bigger root, get technical again, low, bigger rootstock, like one of the rootstocks you've heard of. I don't know about rootstock. But you need a low, big, you've got to really control it. You need good canopy management. You've got to keep that canopy trimmed back otherwise it gives you too many leaves and not enough fruit but they kind of pioneered something in New Zealand that nobody else had really done before which was the idea of sweep picking not like the guitar technique that I haven't mastered mainly because they don't go around picking up sweeps technique. they don't pick up sweeps no. right uh, not anymore because there's no chimneys in New Zealand they don't have those now it's really green country um <laughs> the idea of sweep picking is you go out to the vineyard and you pick the fruit where it's it's in good condition hmm. but it'll have the really greener flavors the high acidity low sugar and then you go out a bit later and you pick, pick a bit later. So your fruit's got a bit ripe, a bit more sugar, a bit less acidity. Your flavor profile's moving on. And then you go out again and you've got lower acidity, higher sugar, so you get more alcohol, more sweetness. But you've got riper fruit and then blending all that together. So not just regional blending, but the idea of why don't we just take a vineyard and pick it at different points so we can get lots of acidity, we can get some sugar and we get really ripe tropical fruit and stick all that together. Genius. Winning. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Absolutely. Chicken. Do you know what? Roast chicken with herbs. Nothing, nothing, to, not a rich no, gravy. No, no, nothing too rich. No, could... Talking of that, have we got any snack chat going on, Dan? Dan's behind the screen tonight, um, coping with um, all the live chat. Um, I really wanted to do the Alan Partridge gag then and just repeatedly shout Dan to have him ignore it. But anyway. <laughs> you are greatly, says Mrs. Lee. I wonder, yes. Brilliant. Oh, you've given it away now. You've broken <laughs> the illusion. Somebody might go, oh, wow. What I want to know is great. where's Mr. Caroline saying the same thing? Indeed. So well, okay. One. Brilliant. Julia, we'd love to know why. Um, that's what tonight is all about. So I've got... Know, what are you eating with it? If, if, I, if I keep looking down... It's because I've got Mr. Alex Taylor texting me constantly from America as we speak, I which is it was very you distracting. Going, How much longer do I? <laughs> no, yeah, it's like... <laughs> not get, you can't dress yourself appropriately. <laughs> oh, it's Jamie and Dan on the group chat. So, boys, I love you, but I'm taking my Apple Watch off for a bit. Um, ask any questions. Um, I might not be able to answer them, but do amazingly well. Um, I'm doing myself a disservice. I probably Huge might yourself. be able Huge to. As more well. experience than one than I have. <laughs> some distance. Um, uh, and we love a bit of snack. Oh, That's oh, a, a, a thing, no, right. <laughs> thank you, Tring Winery. We love that. We, I'll has, pay you later. So has this? Would this change your opinion towards New Zealand serving a bit? Yes, I think it would because. You know, you were talking about um, aromatics. So if I'm going New Zealand, I almost always go Pinot Gris from New Zealand these days because I love uh, I love an aromatic. So Pinot Gris from northern Italy, which I have waxed lyrical about on here before, or, or New Zealand um, is one of my go-tos. But I think the, the balance, 
balance, Jamie, balance, balance, balance that goes into this. Um, and the blend of fruit from two different regions, I think, brings a lot more interest into this Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Plus, it's a female winemaker, whoop, Big whoop, like um, which I love. Um, and I just, I just can tell that there's craft in here, yeah. you know? And I think I've probably fallen foul of the commercial bang it out. More yeah. Sauvignon Blanc yeah. recipe. I, I think it's it's easy to fall foul of that as well because if we look at the development of certain brands, and this is I'm not going to name any brands because nobody wants to get sued by. I'm not saying it as a pejorative at all. No. But if you look at the success of some brands that maybe we drank, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and they've become very successful and they've got a bit bigger. And when that happens, it's like your favourite band when they get signed to a huge label, they become mm. a bit more commercial because they have to. Yeah, they've sold their souls the to the devil. Yeah. You know, some of those brands, so there's, there's a particular brand that I'm thinking of, but again, I won't name because it sounds like a majority of the thing. It absolutely is not. And the style changed when it, it, it reached that level of commercial success. And I remember retasting it, so I'm like, oh, I'm a bit disappointed because it didn't yeah. do what I wanted it to do, but mm. it wasn't aimed at me. It wasn't for no. me. I think that, as you say, it's got a craft in it. Um, and they're quite young. They're only been going since 2003, 2004, something like that. That's really lovely museums. I'd, I'd have a glass or two of that and thoroughly enjoy it. Yeah. Me too. Definitely. Okay, let's move on to the third white. I've taken my watch off now, so I've got no idea of time. So apologies if well, we're was overrunning. Well, I was called the Ken Dodd of wine, but I'm not entirely sure if that was a compliment. I mean, if you were going to talk about... Do you pay I'm... your taxes? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Good. More than... Yeah. I'm not Gary... I wasn't called the Gary Barlow of wine, right? um, Or any other celebrity that apparently may or may not have done such a thing. Um I was called that because I have a tendency to sort of go on and on and mm. on and on. But then I thought I could have, I would have rather been called the Bruce Springsteen of wine. Um, but maybe he's just too cool for Yeah. For but anyway. If Bruce Springsteen is um, definitely better than Ken Dog. Yeah, I'll take Unless it. you've got a feather duster. I, I, if I had, if we had a Diddy Man. I mean, Alex, <laughs> Alex isn't tall. He's not tall man now. Like, you've ever seen Alex in real life, right, yeah. for any viewers. You'll meet him in real life and he goes, this is the action figure. Because yeah. he's, he's got a little thing in his back so and he does that. He sets up the cameras very cleverly <laughs> to deal with perspective. <laughs> it really at all. Um, so anyway, yes, this so we're going to Chile. We are going to Chile, which is a country I properly love. Okay, because I was going to ask a question. That, okay. And you kind of answered it. Okay. But it's, it's sort of, it's a bit of a binary question because everything today is binary, isn't it? Yeah. Chile, exciting, yes or no? Yes, massively. Yeah. Massively. So I think where Chile sits from a consumer standpoint, Chile's hugely successful, consumers love it. Yeah. I don't think the vast majority of consumers, it's a very broad brush stroke for all consumers in the UK, all in one big box that I'm putting them in, mm. necessarily perceive the excitement of Chile, because what Chile has done so well, is kind of entry level kit, and they've done it really well for the last 15 years. So back when I first became a wine merchant, there was a, a it was a blend, admittedly, but it was four quid, and it was great, it's fantastic. And then slowly that average price has risen, but you'd still go, do you know what the Chilean whatever cab at five quid, brilliant. Now it's six, now it's seven. Mm. Trying to get people out of that and go, the the stuff out here, they do it really well. It's a little bit harder. So the, almost their success has, has become a slight issue. But I think Chile is very very exciting. It is, and I think why I love Chile so much, it's it's almost, almost to be very simplistic. You don't need to go anywhere else because it's 4,300 kilometres in length. Um, and at its narrowest, it's 95 kilometres across. So it's very, very thin, very, very narrow, um, long. But you go from the de driest desert in the world, the Atacama Desert, down to Patagonia in the Antarctic. And everything. Is you know, their lake district is, isn't is like, our oh, it's beautiful. I was there last week. It was very nice. But their lake district is volcanoes, ice-covered volcanoes and lakes. Literally one of the most stunning things I've ever seen. Um, and you've seen the shirt. And, so and, I mean, and, and that is a, wow. a whole thing of, on, of <laughs> itself. <laughs> is cultural paradise. If we were in an awful situation, <laughs> most of us are. Imagine we were in an even, even worse well, situation. Even worse than 2022. Even worse than 2022. Um, all great varieties wouldn't be extinguished, um, even though they're not on fire, but you know what I mean. Yeah. 
and somebody said you can plant grapes anywhere you want but you can only choose one place oh chili you have to really argue against chili because yeah. it's pure it's got great quality sunlight because you generally mm. at higher out argentina talks about elevation but chili's got a bit of that as well yeah you don't have phylloxera you, you have fewer vineyard illnesses there compared to they do have them but fewer compared to other places it's really difficult for horrible stuff to get in because you've mm. got ocean mountains so well predicted cold. yeah you've got and the andes on one side and the coastal range of mountains I, I was on, on the, the other plane in Santiago de Chile and had a, a banana skin because i'd eat banana on the plate uh, yes i do eat fruit sometimes um although it doesn't look it I couldn't get this banana skin off the plate so like whoa 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 that's a biological hazard Actually, I think they were talking about me. But, um, <laughs> they let the banana skin out and kept you on the plane. Biological hazard. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chile is gorgeous. It's stunning. It's got this huge wine producing history. Yep. I know the online wine tasting club in Chile before. I think I was on that one. I think you were. Um, so go back and watch it. It's fantastic. Hilarious as well, all off the cuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it's got all those things going on. Now, they're most planted white grape. You'll never guess. Is it Sauvignon? It's Sauvignon Blanc. Sorry, Bless I just you. had to sneeze. It's uh, the Sosomethoxy pyrazines with the green bell pepper. Absolutely. No, no, no. Oh, green bell pepper. There we go. Mm. Mm. There we go. People at home have given you something. Let's have a look. Acidic lemon mineral. Okay. I'm give this a so taste. people aren't getting so much of that tropical fruitiness mm. Mm. as in number two. And I would have expected this to be more tropical mm. in style. Um, so this Sauvignon Blanc comes from the Central Valley um, of Chile, and um, I was about to wax lyrical about cool climate Chile and, um, cold, you know, further north, um, but um, this is in the Central Valley, and that is not doing it a disservice at all, because well-farmed vineyards in the Central Valley produce some cracking wines, yeah. don't they? Yeah. We, we, we over, again, there's a lot of oversimplification in wine. And a lot of the time for very good reasons, mm. because it is it's not a it's not a mysterious subject. It's a big subject. Yes. Which leads to it having the impression that it's mysterious. So we do oversimplify at times and we have this idea that we that if, if it's big and it's flat fertile soils, it's bad. It's, 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 no, it's different. And every wine has a place and every style has a place. And there are certain things you do in particular places that that warrant that and, and mean that you can have those particular wines. So it's Central Valley it comes mainly from Curico, which interests. So again, it's like Curico is famous because it's kind of big volume, yeah. but it's big volume and it's reliable. Yeah. There's a reliability in Chile across the board from entry level to um, super premium that a lot of other countries don't necessarily have. Mm. Um, again, that's a very nuanced conversation perhaps, but, but Curico is the most vinously diverse part of Chile. So everything's growing there, which tells you a lot about it. Yeah, everything grows here. There's diversity, so it must have a range of stuff going. It's not just one uniform area. Mm. It's really interesting, and there's, there's great yeah. volumes of really good stuff. And it's the home of one of my all-time king of wines, which is Mr. Torres. Yes, we have to. We're not. We, 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 yeah, we, this, yeah. Right? And so he chose Curaçao as his home in Chile. Seventy-nine. Um, so you know the fact that it's from Curaçao Central Valley. Yes, there is more mechanical farming mm -hmm. done there. Yes, you can irrigate more because it's flat. And, you know, I, there will be video of me on here saying if it's if it's flat and it can be farmed and it can be irrigated, you don't get as good quality fruit. You've got to go higher up where it's hard and the fruit, fruit's got to work harder. Um, but I think I think that is too binary. I think that's too simplistic because you can have some flat vineyards that are brilliant quality. Um, you know, there's a lot of flat vineyards in Marlborough. Yeah. And it, it's down to what you want the wines to do, how you want the grapes to respond and what you do with it, rather than that simplification. Mm. You and and it's, a good, it's a good place to start. Go flat is this, slope means that, but then as you explore it a bit more. Um, the wine itself, because you're talking about style. So I think where Chilean Blanc sits very brilliant. There's a lot of wine producers in Chile, a lot of Sauvignon Blanc being made. I think where Sauvignon Blanc from Chile sits, is I, I bracket Sauvignon Blanc. We have Turenne at one side, which is that citrusy, maybe greener fruit style like the yep. one we've had here. And then you have New Zealand at the other, which is the big, pungent, punchy passion fruit. If you, if you sort of draw a line in the middle, I think that's where South Africa sits. As Alex mentioned, he went there on his honeymoon. To, oh, I think he might have done Africa. occasionally. We need to show based around that, to be honest. Yeah. 
if you put that we'll show right more holiday way, snaps of his honeymoon definitely. soon i think chili sort of sits somewhere in this half of that scale broadly speaking mm. partly it's the cool climate there's a lot of chili and stuff now where chili is really exciting because it's quite narrow but it's very long we tend to think of Chilean valleys as being east to west. Historic, whether they are or not, we just go valley. Yeah. Chile's long and narrow, so it might yep. be that way. Whereas now we're thinking of Chile this way. So you sort of go, you've got the mountainous bit, you've got the bit by the sea, and then there's the bit in the middle. Mm. And actually, there's a lot of cool climates. So Leda Valley is really exciting in particular. Yeah. Really cool climate, Sauvignon, which allows you to get somewhere closer to a terrain or sunset style than maybe in New Zealand. And I think in wine... If you're going to do something, don't copy someone straight out. Be influenced by them. There's a quote by Keith Richards about passing it forward. So, mm. oh, he sounds a bit like Chuck Berry. Yes, he does, but he doesn't play exactly like Chuck Berry. If you're a wine producer, go, right, okay, I like what New Zealand does or what France does, but I'm, I'm going to take that and just do my own thing with it. Yeah. And I think that's where Chile's got to. So this example is from Vinya Rakingwa, uh, who was established in 1961. Mm -hmm. I think they're in the top 10 producers in Chile by volume. Uh, I'd have to, they're, they're pretty big, but I spent some time with the winemaker Benoit Fit about six, seven years ago. Who's he's French? Also, he was French. Yeah, so and he brings gone, all of I'm that. I'm getting influence. out of here. Right. I'm going to Chile. Yeah. Right. But he and brings he's... all of his French Sauvignon knowledge and expertise yeah. with him. Yes, he does. And um, yeah, I think that's all. I'm trying to think. What, what are the tasting notes we had? Um, so we had sort of some lime and citrus, if I remember. Mineral um, tastes. Sharp. Like all other SB. Okay, oh, okay, so I'm guessing that probably when we do the poll at the end of the evening, um, I think I know which Sauvignon Blanc might win. But, an idea, but mm, shall we move on to some reds? I have always said, Caroline, the first duty of any wine is to be red. <laughs> okay, and, and, and after that? that fact, and after that, other stuff is nice. Okay, excellent. So, um, Danny, are we ready for the video? We've got a thumbs up. So before we move on to the reds, please feel free to pour them into your glass. Um, we are going back to our very dear friends over in Argentina, um, Al Pasión, um, and lovely Cathy, who I think is in the is watching. She's in the chat. Hello, Cathy. Um, she has been out there. I don't know if she's still there, but she's been out there. Uh, we've got a, pi a lovely picture of her in, in uh, her beautiful knees um, in shorts. So um, that's a joy. Thank you very much for sending this through, Cathy. Um, and she's talking a bit about Sauvignon and Cabernet over in Argentina. So enjoy. Hi, it's Cathy here from Al Pachon Vineyard in the Uco Valley in Mendoza, Argentina, and I'm pleased to be actually reporting from the vineyard rather from my home in the UK. Let's catch up on where we left off last month, which was with making Sauvignon Blanc. The grapes were harvested, were transported to the winery, went through the destemmer machine and then went into the fermentation tank. And we pick it up nearly at the end of the Sauvignon Blanc fermentation. How many days did you ferment for? ¿Cuántos días fermentaste? Uh, 15. 15. Days. 15 days? Yes. Uh, 15. Uh, so, solo en estos días que 15. A partir de los otros. No, no, no. Esto. So, he said, all the process that we saw, uh, but because it's white, we need, they need to take out the peel. To get the color. Skin. Yeah. The skin. So it was to the press mm -hmm. and then it was called for uh, six days, no? Mm -hmm. For six days to separate the, the, skin. Like the solids uh, or to add eight grades, uh, centimeters. And then was here and it was 15 days. The same Sauvignon Blanc we tasted on Friday, it's now Tuesday and it's now completely dry and very tropical fruit flavours. Now, 
which was initially in text, then in over for 12 months. And then back in text. And then back in text, in text to blend it all. To blend it. Okay. And then bottle. So you do and the blending in the sleeve? In the sleeve. Yeah. Yeah. And they stabilize it in cold. Yes, that's why you see that this time is yeah. Es una hoja característica de la variedad Cabernet Sauvignon. Tiene cinco lóbulos. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. And they say that it's a perforated leaf because when you put together the two ends, you have a perfect hole. And this part is a perfect V. Awesome. It's a very big bunch. Here we have Kathy harvesting the Malbec. Well done. So we've got whole bunches going in there. <laughs> See you next month for the next update from Al Pachon Vineyard in Mendoza, Argentina. Welcome back. Um, I just love being able to actually see it all happening in the vineyards and the winery because that's what it's all about. And, you know, I'd love to get back out to somewhere again at some point because it really, if you love wine, actually being there where the magic happens just is is quite magical, isn't it? There's, there's a lot you can learn about wine from books and from tasting notes and from, I'll say it because I'm on it, but, you know, from great shows and initiatives like the Online Wine Tasting Club. And I'm not saying that because I'm a guest because I'm not going to be invited <laughs> back after the first five minutes of this episode. But, <laughs> you know, so many opportunities for learning and tasting education and, and, and kind of what, what I like about what, what goes on here and when I'm invited to do it, sharing our love and passion for it. Yeah. I think that's so important. But nothing, nothing beats the experience of going to where this stuff is made, whether mm. that's, you know, we've got lots of opportunity in English wine now to do that, of course. But when you go somewhere further afield that really feels to an English tourist off the beaten track like Argentina or Chile, that feels like somewhere that that to us feels like a really new place to go. I yeah. think nothing beats that just whether that's getting in the vineyard, as, as we saw in that video there, when it's actually happening. Or if you go there in, in the equivalent of winter in their winter and you're in the winery, it just it's mad. And there's the smells. Yeah, the, the smell. I was in a. A functioning winery earlier this year um and, and in the uk but they make also not just sort of grape based wines they make other, other like fruit based wines and things like that and just going there and having that smell of a winery mm -hmm. for the first time in you know two years or something like that was just of a working wine it was mm. incredible yeah yeah, yeah no you can't you can't describe the smell it's no. so unique if, if you've been it? there you know what the smell yeah. is if you don't which is the great thing about you know with tasting wine and doing smells like if you've been mm. there you know what that smell is mm. if you don't then you don't know what that smell mm. is. There's no other way to kind of, you know, you've never smelled fresh leather. Yeah. You can't describe it. Yeah. It's fresh leather, that's what it yeah. smells like. 
So, um, yeah, but we get to right. travel the world. We do. Right here. We do. And what's great about the lineup is that we're going from one Chilean wine to another. Yes. So we're staying. That's why you've planned this. I know. I know. Things are, getting, things are getting a bit too formal and proper around here. It's almost like words. we think about things. <laughs> um, almost. Well, we won't go too crazy. Um, so we're staying in Chile, but we're jumping to the first of our red wines. Um, and we're looking at Cabernet Sauvignon for our reds, yes. um, which arguably could be considered a king of reds in terms of popularity, in terms of planting, in terms of fame. Yes. So... So we have this interesting thing in wine, right, that wines are like people, are, a lot of consumers, and again, broad generalization, probably not the people watching this, but sort of the broader range of consumers. We have this idea that they're quite reticent about things they can't pronounce, which is why Muscadet was so popular in the 70s. And back in the 70s, it was rubbish. It isn't now. It's awesome. But back in the 70s, someone's saying, I had a good one in the 70s. You didn't. It's awful. But we could pronounce it. <laughs> so we asked for it. Muscadet. Now, Cabernet Sauvignon is... I think you remember being aware of, like, as a kid, like six, seven years old, I was aware that there was, Shiraz was probably the first, actually. I was aware there's a great called Cabernet Sauvignon. And the popularity, it's quite a difficult thing to pronounce. You know, I, mm. I think I still, you know, used to been doing this for a long time, but I think you still look at Cabernet Sauvignon. If you don't know how to pronounce grapes or word, French words, it can be a bit tricky. But it's usually popular, but I've got a stat for you. So I do stats sometimes. I like stats. Right. 1980. Yeah. Eighth most planted grape in the world. Okay. Okay. Planting's more than doubled. Today it's the most, but it's the most planted wine grape. Do total, it. red or white. To total, everything. Um, to, to go all Alan Partridge. The most planted grape is actually Thompson Seedless. But, um, <laughs> Tannoy, the public address system. Anyway, um, it's the most planted wine grape. Right. So 1980, eighth most planted. Yep. 30 years, nearly 40 years. 40 years. I've just realised how old I am. That's I'm just going to go and cry now. <laughs> Forty-two years later, number one, big spot. And again, it, it's not grown everywhere, but it's great. If there's a wine producing country, they'll grow. What you've got yeah. with Cab Sobe is it, it does need a bit of heat and warmth, so you can't grow it somewhere too cool, no, because it goes a bit stalky. Where weirdly, it might taste a bit like Cabernet Franc. I wonder if they're related. No I idea. Probably have looked that up before. Yeah, maybe it was in the I'm opening sure. credits. And, no, I don't know. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't listen. No, I didn't listen no, either. But anyway, um, I, so Capto, I think. So I'm just putting this together, and people might um, have different feelings. And if you do, please share them with me because I, I form. I, I'm in a bubble, right? Because I've only ever done the wine trade, so I'm aware that I think of things in a very wine trade capacity. But I think Cab Sauve is one of those varieties that when you pour it and you smell it and you taste it, it kind of gives that people go, that's what a red wine should do. Mm. Whether they know how to articulate that any further is irrelevant and is not important to, and, and doesn't get in the way of somebody's enjoyment at all. But I think they look at it and they taste it and it's this sort of slightly sturdy, slightly full of red wine. It works really well with oak, so you get those richer flavours. It tastes like red wine should taste. It looks like red wine should taste. And there's also this interesting thing with Cab Sauve that, Cab Sauve kind of always tastes like Cab Sauve. Cheap, high volume, expensive, small, but it kind of always tastes like Cabernet Sauvignon. So that's a big tick, because like, you mm. can taste it and go, this always tastes the same. Typicity. Oh, typicity. Uh, it's easy for you to say. Yeah, exactly. It has that. But it's a hugely, hugely popular grape variety. It is. And I think you're right. It, it does what it's meant to. Um, it has structure. Yeah. Um, because, um, uh, and, and not to go to, it, uh, it definitely has balance. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, Jamie, you're going to kill me. Um, and without going too geeky, it has structure because of the grapes and tannins and everything that gives a red wine structure comes from the skins and the skins in Cabernet Sauvignon are a little bit thicker. Um, so it has more structure to it as a wine. Um, it has enough fruit, um, mm -hmm. depending on where it comes from, it has more or less fruit. Um, I know when I've been doing lots of consumer tastings, people see Cabernet Sauvignon, they typically describe it as being a dry red. And I think that comes from that tannic structure and balance with the fruit, that it, it dries your mouth. So. Um, it, it may have some residual sugar 
of varying levels, but because of the structure that comes with it, it's typically called dry red yeah. by um, people that I've I've done tastings with. Um, so, but the, where it's really started to get its name from, and we'll come to that later, it wasn't on its own. It's only really come as a single varietal king of grapes fairly recently because, of course, it got its name in in Bordeaux. In Bordeaux. So I, I would have to, my, my one question of, I was saying to you earlier before mm. we um, sort of went on air, there's a real cult of Cabernet, so that this cult of Cabernet drinkers who adore it, but you've got a cult of Pinot Noir. But you've got this cult of Cabernet, and I think that's driven more by the American style, so that big, broad, Napa thing going on. And I've never really got it. So mm. I, I've, here's my confession to you. Mm. Um, I've never had a Cabernet Sauvignon where I've truly gone, that is exactly what it's all about. I've had Cabernet Sauvignons and gone, this is incredible, I love it. I've never had one that's gone that extra where I've had Pinot Noirs or Rieslings for whites that have that have done that. And so partly I sort of look at it and go, I think Cabernet Sauvignon has built a reputation with a crutch. <gasps> now like crutch, Tiny Tim. Like Tiny Tim, but a lot more lovable. Um, which way did that phrase go? I'll let you decide, dear audience. If you're using Merlot as a crutch, I mean you've got a Merlot is not Pinot Noir as a crutch because no. Pinot is awesome to lean on, but Merlot as a crutch, well, jammy fruit, naughty, naughty Cabernet. Yeah, but that what you said, dry red, very structured, so it's got high pip to pulp ratio, mm. so only thick skin, as you point out, big tannin. Where Cab Soap is sometimes lacking, like you get a big impression when it enters the mouth, lots of structure, it's got lots of acidity and tannin and that dryness, and then flavor at the finish, but mm. somewhere in that. Uh, to get geeky in the mid palette, we'll. You ever been to the mid palette? We've all been there. We'll take a trip around the mid palette. <laughs> well, we do it every weekend. Sometimes that's a bit ho hollow. Mm. That's good. That's good. Falls a term. bit flat. You want to impress your friends with wine terms? Use the word hollow. Um, if they ask what it means, so, I don't know. Every user, Merlot kind of pops in there and goes, "Hey, some plums." Hi. I've got plums and fruit, and then disappears. Again. Yeah. But the t this is that great thing we were talking about. You know the French concept of terroir and putting stuff together. But feeling it for Bordeaux blend. Oh, okay. It. Interesting, Tom. Big up for the Bordeaux massive, Tom. Yeah. Get it. Maybe we're going to get there. Can I just say, I have had a single varietal Cabernet in my life that I just went, cha-ching, I've hit the jackpot. How many bottles have you had before? Um, no, it's not relevant. Well, I don't think we need to go into my personal drinking habits here. No. no. It's, it's not that kind of confessional. <laughs> I, I put all my glass recycling in the next door neighbour's bin. I just so. bring it here now. <laughs> <laughs> God, what was what was this cabernet that was revelatory? So it it was not from Chile. Um, I oh, shock horror. I know I love Chile. Sorry, Chile. Um, it was from the country we're going to next, which is the wonderful Australia. Australia. Should we have a quick taste of this one? Yeah. And you can tell me more about yeah. this Australian. Yeah. Because I'm in. I'm in. Okay. Hundred percent of this conversation. Black, now that's weird. Who would have thought black currant? Black currant. So we talk about all great varieties have a signature or a particular character that identifies them. So with Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, we would expect black blackcurrants to be the primary feature. With Pinot Noir, we might expect strawberries. Uh, Pinot Grigio's key feature is disappointment. But I think the fact that you've picked <laughs> up black currant. Now, here, no. You, no, Grigio. Grigio is green. But, but, green is fine. But, that's fine. That's but, a different. Okay. All right. Yeah, anyway. The gag doesn't work really with any other variety. No. Um, but I'm working on that. Okay. But yeah, black, black current, cassis, that's the kind of thing I look for. Now, I think I've seen what things I admired about Chile and Chilean winemaking. I like to think with a country, you kind of go, what does this country do in terms of variety? So New Zealand does Sauvignon Blanc, Argentina does Malbec, you know, Australia does Shiraz. They're the primary mm. things. What do they do within that? For me, you know, you look at South Africa and go, South Africa does blending. They, they think nothing of blending they're amazing at it incredible hey chili for me does varietal purity yes i agree they get to the heart of what that grape is supposed to taste like mm. kind of better than because everybody else is doing mm. all this cool stuff but i think chili just nails that yeah i think you're right and um you know i have had some top end blends from sort of bordeaux blends from chili which are magnificent um mm. but i think it's single varietal 
genius is what sets Chile apart. Um, so, okay. Mm. So let's move on to my number five. Um, Peter Lehman, um, Masters Barossa Cabernet. Now, this is a, a wine brand that I love and I know that you love as well. Indeed. So um, but you, you are really clued upon. Well, yes. I mean, not as not as much as some, another Australian wine brand, which um, has been mentioned once or twice on here. Um, but the Cabernet Sauvignon I tasted once that just blew me away was um, a Kunawara Australian Cabernet. Kunawara. Kunawara, mate. Uh, I'm not very good at accents, bon if you notice. Um, and it had fruit and it had structure and it had a beautiful essence of eucalyptus. Mm. Um, and you get that a lot in Kunawara Cabernet because the vineyards are surrounded by eucalyptus trees, largely. A lot of koalas. A lot of koalas. Um, the soil in Kunawara is amazing. It's sort of this terracotta, terra rossa, yeah. beautiful soil. And it just produces the most unique Cabernet Sauvignons. And um, I had a really good one once, and it blew my socks off. Um, however, we're not tasting a Kunawara Cabernet. <laughs> Who likes the Beatles? <laughs> This is by the Rolling Stones. Um, we're not going to Kunawara. No, so, so this is really interesting, right? So we're going to Barossa. We're going to Barossa. Kunawara. But and um, Barossa is typically famous for Shiraz. Shiraz, Shiraz is fifty-two percent of plantings in Barossa. Cab is only six percent. Mm. But you can. You, what is it that quote about statistics are much like a lamppost to a blind individual? They're more for support than illumination. <laughs> You know, that, that doesn't tell you the whole story. It's, oh, it's only 6% of plantings. Yeah, but what can you do with that yeah. 6%? And when you taste what you can, what Peter and Andrew Wigan, who's the winemaker, you taste what they can do with that 6%, you go, I think you should notch that up to 12%. Yeah. Uh, go to 11 at the very least. Always go to 11 But But what I love about this, and this range um, within the Peter Lehman estate, is that they, they've called it masters. They're taking the classic grape varieties from the very best vineyards within this region and creating gems with them. Um, and Peter Lehman, it, the history behind it, sadly, he is with us no more. Um, years ago. Yeah. Um, but he um, started um, way back when um, in the in the late 70s. Um, and he went to a lot of really hard up wine growers who were about to go bust and it, he recognized that it would have been a tragedy for some brilliant old vines within some great regions of Australia and he said I'll take all of your harvest but I can't afford to pay you until I've sold the wine and he struck up a relationship with them and they trusted him and he came good on his word. his word and he went back and he paid the growers and it meant that they could survive yeah. and um everything about his philosophy has been about protecting brilliant growers um and obviously they they'll have vineyards of their own but he he's about protecting the real gems um in barossa um wine region and he 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 just had such a hugely ethical approach to winemaking, to what with vine growing, the kind of ethics. Before we re, it feels like we've only you mentioned earlier that you know the, the tin pot. Marlborough is, is female owned, female winemaker. We haven't talked about that for so long that now we're now we're talking about it, it's great. We're talking about mm. ethics in wine and, and promoting more women in wine and and, and all of these things, which are so important. So why have we not talked about them yet? Yeah. So Peter Lehman, you know being very ethical in wine before it was even a thing, like before it was cool, right? And not that it's not, it is cool and it should be, but I didn't mean that in this kind of mm. slightly facetious way I delivered that. Um, so back in 79, when he did it, you know, it was the, the reason they were struggling was there was a glut of grapes. Australia yeah. had too many grapes, too much liquid. So to, to then step in and go, okay, we've got too much liquid, but I'm going to make liquid with this and sell it. When I think of Barossa, my first thought is Peter Lehman. There are other mm. great, great producers there. I, I'm not suggesting otherwise, but that is you, you have that word association, Barossa, Peter Lehman. That's exactly where I go to. Big German guy. 
um, who, if you ever went to his vineyard when he was still around, he had like, and it's hot in Barossa, right? You get to the end of the growing season, it's over 35 degrees. Mm. It's a hot place. He had this big metal hut that he'd sit in and he had sausages hanging up. And people go, all oh, oh, right, here's German sausage. No, it's true, that's what he would do. And he'd just go and sit in this hut, like in the middle of the day, and just rip bits of sausage up and munch them while everything's going. Brilliant, brilliant winemaker. You know, really pioneered the region, really protected the region. Yeah. Which dates back to, I think the first plantings were down to an English guy in 1840. So it's one of Australia's most historic regions. We talk about, you mentioned old vines. It's a big movement now talking about that. Which again, it's great. Let's put focus on old vines because they're really cool. Wine is history. Some yeah. of these vines are 100 years old or older. There's this guy in the late 70s, early 80s going, we've got to protect that. Yeah. And that is. Yeah. And um, it just reminded me of another story um, because Peter Lehman, as we've said, is sadly no longer with us. Um, but he, um, the the brand of Peter Lehman has been bought by um, a company called Casella Family Brands, who I used to work for, um, and I love them dearly. Um, they also own a um, a big brand called Yellowtail. Yellow yeah, 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 I know. That. Never heard of that before. Um, but John Casella is arguably one of the most genuine amazing human beings that I've ever met. Um, he came over to the UK um, when we hit a, a brilliant milestone with the Yenatel brand. And he sat down next to me on the coach to go out for dinner and he just went, tell me about you. And so I went into my corporate, well, we're doing this and we've planned that. And, and he went, no, 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 Caroline, tell me about you. Tell me about your family. And he is such a family centric person um, that instantly makes you feel relaxed and they bought Peter Lehman and various other premium family mm -hmm. wineries because they want to keep the legacy of what Peter Lehman stood for going um, ad infinitum mm -hmm. um, and where they are based in Yenda um, the you know as you would expect with a big commercial winery huge big steel vats and everything else in the middle of that is the original Casella family home really? where they still gather for family lunches all together. So they're not going to run out of wine. At this they're point. not going to run out of wine. Lunches. No, literally you just turn on the taps. But isn't that lovely that they've protected what it all started as and they've built around it. Um, and that says so much to me about the company. And so, you know, please don't feel scared that it's been bought by somebody who owns a big brand because family and ethics are everything Again, to them. We, we sort of mentioned this at the start that we, we tend to be quite reductive in wine and, and take very simple ideas and they promulgate, you know, the big is bad and, and, and it isn't, you know, 80% of the Australian crush is down to five companies. But if those companies didn't exist, these, the smaller people would just disappear because mm. This may come as a shock to some people. There's not a lot of money in wine, and there's certainly not a lot of money in growing old vines and selling mm. grapes to growers. But this is this is heritage, and you know one of the reasons I love. There are many reasons I love wine so much, but you know it's that story, it's that connection to something greater. That you know the vines that have gone into this, I think they're upwards of sort of 50, 60 years old. The people who planted those vines probably aren't around now, and I'm mm. through tasting this wine, I'm connected to them in yeah. some very minor way, but in a way that some with my particular outlook and other people share it just means so much more that's yeah a, that's a wonderful story yeah it's great isn't it and i'm just looking and i'm i just had another sip myself and i'm Balance. looking at that and i think that's smooth, smooth. you know it's it is it's easy it's drinking a, a, a easy drinking right this in a way this shouldn't be easy drinking right it's 14 and a half percent it's barossa cab it's got a tiny little like soup song of shiraz in it it should be like really big and beefy and hefty and you should be getting through the first glass and going yeah it isn't and that you can only do with great wine making you can make great wines that are balanced and easy to do 15 percent, but it's hard yeah and, and it's got so much variety of character to it so this has got i think a couple of years maybe not quite a couple of about 15 months in french oak but they're larger, so normally we, that you see bariques. This is hogsheads, which is 250 litres. Yeah, bigger. Fine. That oak is there, but it's just, it's integrated and it's layered all that big fruit. Dare I say and... the words, 
elegant for a big Aussie cab. Oh, right, hang on, we need to we need to get this ratified. <laughs> um, elegant for a big Aussie cab. You, sh you shouldn't, right? No, that's not. No, it's close to it. Yeah, it's, it's silky smooth. It is. Um, that is. It's class, isn't it? As someone who's a bit, oh, you know, yeah. I don't get the call to cab. I think that's that's fabulous. And I, I got into wine through Australia, so it's a huge thing. For mm. me. You know, I wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for Australian. Yeah. Wine, so. Thanks, Australia. Yeah. Bonza. Bonza. Pomegranate juice. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. Yeah, I quite like that. It's got that freshness to it. Yeah. Right. Should we move on to the last of the evening? I think we should. I think we should. The home of Cabernet. Arguably yeah, the is. home of Sauvignon together. Yeah. Cabernet or Blanc. Yeah. So these were all kind of... Sauvignon Blanc came first and was essentially just a wild sort of spontaneous crossing which involves Sauvignon, which we again mm. we heard in, in the well you heard in the intro we didn't listen to it because we didn't um Cab Sauv came, so there isn't actually a written record of Cabernet Sauvignon in Bordeaux until sort of like the 18th century or well, they've been making wine a lot longer but at some point it took off and became really popular and this is it's difficult isn't it? What, what's the greatest wine region in the world I think when you talk about everybody's heard of Bordeaux right even if you're yeah. not really into wine everybody's heard of it everybody's familiar with it Bordeaux has a very specific image so even if you're not really into wine, it's called Bordeaux, it's expensive and uh, very good and serious and, and, you know, all of that. But this is where Capso grows here. It grows in a couple of, there's a little bit in Loire, which I mentioned earlier, in a couple of, but this is where Cab made its name. Using Merlot as a crook, as I mentioned. Yep, um, which all Bordeaux does, but not just Merlot. No. Because it can this, be up to five. This has a little bit of Petit Verdot in there. Oh. Cheap. Yeah, there are actually seven red varieties. Oh, but we're getting very nerdy. You're doing a there. Jamie on me. Very nerdy, and nobody needs that on a is it Wednesday. Well, it's a Wednesday, Wednesday. Wednesday. I nobody don't know. Needs that on a Wednesday night. Could be any but day. There's the big five. Mer Merlot is actually the most planted red in Bordeaux. Cab is soon follows, but Cab tends to dominate on the on the left bank, the region we call yep. Medoc, and that, that includes the super famous regions of, of Margot and Pesat de Ognon and mm. Poyac and so on and so forth. And it's got more gravelly soil, hasn't it? More gravelly soil. So, last ice age, I remember it very well. Ice age sweeps in from the east, gets to what is now Bordeaux. Glaciers melt, and it, the glaciers leave five separate gravel de deposit layers. And those five layers have become the five key communes of Bordeaux, so Poyac, Margot, saint julien saint Estef, and Pesat de Ognon. That's where all that gravel comes from, but they're very different layers. Right. But the gravel's really important, right? Because, sorry. Right? <laughs> drainage. Uh, drainage. Because you yep. don't want, cab right, Cabernet Sauvignon, and I've sort of knocked it a little bit. Cabernet Sauvignon and, and me, we're kind of like that. We have a lot in common, right? We don't like the cold and we don't like the rain. Okay. Cold and rain, Cab Sauv goes, no. Nah. No, nah, I'm not. I'm, not I'm done. Rain. So you want good drainage, gravel. Yeah. And you want it to be a bit warmer. Well, you're in Bordeaux, okay, southwest France, mm. a bit of cloud from the Atlantic, maybe. Yeah. But you've got good conditions there. What Cab Sauve really wants is a, quite a long period of time to develop. So it's quite late ripening and budding, but it needs a long time to really get to quality. And Bordeaux actually presents that, gives it time to develop. So it's not too, it's kind of Goldilocks, right? It's not too hot, it's not too cold. It's, it's not just too right. Dry. It's just perfect. It's like the habitable zone for yeah. the planet Earth. Whereas Merlot typically grows more on the right bank, yes. which is a bit warmer, yeah. produces the jammier, bit, bit plummier clay, fruit. Yeah, so less less drainage, yeah, yeah. sorts it all out. Yeah, keeps just enough water going into the Merlot. Yeah, I'm starting to think the French should have something with this terroir concept. Oh, do you reckon? Do you reckon there's something Quite in possibly. it? Quite possibly. Yeah. Okay. Um, but this is so this particular producer. So, this is, so we know about the 1850. People say people say French wine is complicated. I'm going to disprove over the next few minutes it, with the conversation we'll have, which is not planned. So this is why Caroline's going. I'm going. going I had no idea what he's talking wine, about. It's not, French wine isn't complicated. So if you listen closely for the next ten minutes or so, you'll understand. Well, well can we not make it ten minutes? Can we make it a minute and a half? A minute and a half. Okay, I'm going to go. I struggle with French wine. I think that's a complete sentence in itself. To be honest, with you. I struggle with French wine apart from Alsace. Oh. So I've got a question for you, Judith. I, I may be way off. Uh, Alsace have varietal labelling. So in Alsace, you're allowed to say mm. wine of Alsace, Gewurztraminer, Riesling. Riesling. Can't yeah. do that anywhere. You're not allowed to say Bordeaux, Cab Sauv, Merlot, Blake. 
Now, I know for a fact Julia knows her stuff. Oh, absolutely. She knows her um, on I, yawns. I certainly wasn't suggesting otherwise. I hope um, so. No, absolutely. But um, Alsace, how can you how can you knock Alsace? It produces some of the greats, right? It does. It Beautiful. really does. Beautiful. Predominantly white. But Alsace, right, so he's, right, Alsace is easy, right? Here's French wine law. Alsace, it says Alsace on the label, AOC, and they call it DOP. Alsace, the fruits come from anywhere in Alsace, from, and they've got permitted grape varieties, mm. right? easy it might say alsace grand cru mm. and that means it's come from a specific bit which will yeah. be named so you've got basically got two layers in alsace that's easy right yeah alsace alsace grand cru which is better it's different many would say better okay yeah two th two things one system job done easy bordeaux go on then explain it to me in a minute and a half paris exposition bordeaux was already recognized as being really good and the French mm. went, Paris Exposition, we want people to have an easy way of understanding what the best wines are yeah. in 1855. That's relevant to this producer. So they went, well, which ones are the most expensive? These four, great. They can be Premier Cru. First growth, the best. Which ones are the second most expensive? This lot here. And they came up with this, I think it's 72 Chateau. That, that's the number I've got in my head, but it's thereabouts. And they built a league table of 72 Chateau and went, they're the best in five different. So these guys at the top, or these guys at the bottom. See, anybody can understand a league table, even me, and I'm a simpleton. But it was only for those 72 chateaux. It didn't include any of the other chateau out there, and it didn't include any of this lot on the right bank. But they, but they surely, I mean, they they went and visited them. They understood the ethics. They tasted the wine. They None of that happened. Went, well, they're the most expensive. They're the best. Done. Okay. Okay. Right. So where it's relevant to this wine is, is the vineyards for this wine kind of border Poyac and Saint-Julien which is where some of the really top wines come from. Yeah. So the vineyards are right next door to vineyards that have suddenly been given this really top status. The estate goes back to 1760-ish. Okay, that's quite old. Only 10 years before the 1855 classification, it fell into disrepair. So okay. if they'd hung on for 10 more years, they might be in that classification, but they're not. Right. It's too late. Okay. You lose, you lose. So are we back in terrain? Um territory here oh, where it's quite dry. <laughs> there. Uh, um where oh, right. it's a great non top league right. wine so, for the money this is the bit that i was ultimately i wanted to get to. right so this wine is called a crew bourgeois, bourgeois. superior and this is what french wine is difficult no it isn't this is really easy 1932 the bordelais went yeah it's a bit unfair that these 72 chateau have one classification what about the rest of them here on the left bank in the Medoc? Mm. So they came up with the Cru Bourgeois and everything was blind tasted. And they said, all these wines are so good. 444 Chateau can all be called Cru Bourgeois. Right. So they went, great. But how does that differentiate us from everybody else? Because you either in the first growth, like in the 1855 yeah. class, or you're a Cru Bourgeois. Oh, yeah, it hasn't really worked, has it? Because what we've done is we've taken a load of people to try and differentiate who's better and just gone, you're all great. They tried to redo it in the 50s, didn't work. Finally, we get to the year 2000. Oh. It's a long time. Year 2000. They should write a song about that. They should, shouldn't they? Um, I don't know if anybody's done that. <laughs> in my head, I'm going, somebody has, but I can't access it. Pulp, pulp. Year 2000. What? Pulp, isn't it? Yes, it was. Year 2000, they went, we've come up with a new system. It's got three tiers to it. It was ratified in 2003. It's about 200. 70 chateau in it problem it was annulled in 2007 they went don't work <laughs> right. french wine's not complicated then in 2010 they launched another one cru bourgeois which related to the wines not the specific chateau oh my god so the one, and then they went no we're not happy with that and in 2020 they launched it again and you've got 154 cru bourgeois you've got i think 50 Cru Bourgeois Superior, which is this, and then you've got 14 Cru Bourgeois Exceptional. French wine's not complicated at all. No. We are talking about French wine, aren't we? We are talking about French What's wine. Like? Is I it any good? I've not I actually tasted it. Do you know yet. what? This is where I think tastes better than it smells. Well, that that's backhanded compliment. I quite like that. Yeah. Um I um that's like you sound better than you look, isn't it? <laughs> I don't sound better than I look, nor do I look better than I sound. <laughs> I exist in a very strange place. Um, um, I, where I am with French wine, 
educate. I, I know enough to work my way around a wine list or a wine shelf to know vaguely, I think that that's worth a punt. Um, lots of people don't. And, uh, and I think that's a crying shame for French wine um, because there's some absolute corkers. Um, but that is why in and of itself, we do this yeah. so that you can try some and you go, actually, I like that. And I haven't had to buy the whole bottle and I'm going to buy a bottle now. Yeah. And we'll come on to that in a second. Um, I think this is a really lovely example of an entry level Bordeaux. I think it's a really good example of it because it's not even entry level Bordeaux. I think it's a really I good think it's Bordeaux. A bit better than that. Where I've struggled with Bordeaux, and I Bordeaux at its best. So I'm a I'm a Pinot lover. So when it comes to French wine, it's Burgundy, and I love the Rhone. Don't drink a huge amount of French wine because um, my wife is from Argentina, so I, I only drink Argentine wine. <laughs> um, I, I drink lots of wines. We love lots of wines, but. Francism was just not naturally on my radar. I spent mm. a lot, you know, I drink a lot of Italian wines and When you taste Bordeaux at its very best, yeah. which I've been very privileged to do, undeservedly privileged to do, nothing beats it. I nothing. agree. I adore Italy. I adore Argentine wine. Nothing but the. But as a result, when you've tasted the very best of something out of Champagne's a really good example. Like when you've had Krug, it's pretty difficult to drink anything else because you I know what this could be. So more affordable Bordeaux often, in my opinion, sort of falls down a bit because it doesn't quite get to the heart of what I know Bordeaux mm. to be. But actually, it's got that nice restrained style for it. It's not big, mm. it's not bad, it's got the structure, but it's got the fruit there. It's got that it nice has. layered integrated oak again, use that word integrated. But I could that's um that's the wine that I could sit just I agree. drink very slowly and really sit. That's a wine that's been made by somebody who understands thirst. Yeah. But it, you, you take a sip and then you, you're you not chugging it. But I, I, yeah, I, 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 I love it. I, I think it's great. I think it's really great. What do people at home think? I can't, I OK, can't. so on that note, shall we go to the poll, the wines of the night? Danny, are we able to do that? So. I think there's some clever wizardry where you can drag your favourite wines up and down or something like that or click them or I, I, I don't know, but I think it's magic. Um, so do your thing at home. Let's see what your wines of the night are. And I think what we should do, Lee, is work out which is the top. Yeah, so, so I think on... I've worked out the top cab and the top. top well, yes, yeah, so, because they're the, the top two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for revealing anybody at home and go, oh, wow, Lee's worked that out very quickly. I didn't, I didn't think doing clever stuff was his stock in trade. And you'd be absolutely right. Six is very good. Okay. Terrible. That's a very good question. It is. So yeah. it is a 2018. 18. So I think, yes, it would benefit from laying down. Yeah, I don't think it's a long term. Um, but I, th I think over the next five years, you'd be safe with that. It may well go longer. But I get what you mean. It's got, it's got that little bit of tannic structure to it. But there's, there's good fruit there. It's mm. vibrant. I, I think some part of the next three to five years, served in the decanter for a couple of hours, I think would be. But it's perfect. good to drink now With as well. With beef wellington. But it drinks very well now. Mm. Again, get it in a decanter, give it a couple of hours. I think that would be absolutely yeah. singing. Yeah, opens up nicely. Um, right. Well, I think we can call it. I'm I'm so chuffed yeah. that Peter Lehman came to the I, I think I'm so happy. That, not that it, it doesn't matter what I think. I keep I say that a lot. I go, I think I'm very well aware that what I think is not important or relevant to anyone, and I'm very happy that it's. I care that what way. you think, Lee. Well, that's far too. I just yeah. kind of like it's the care work, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I I miss the boys so much. I have no one to look after, so I'm starting to look well, after thank you. you. Very much. So. <laughs> I, I, I definitely <laughs> looking after as anybody that knows me will attest. Um, but I I'm really pleased to see those. For me, they they are the two. I think all the wines are lovely. I think they've all got merits uh, and they, they all do different things, which is wonderful because ultimately I think what we wanted to showcase was Sauvignon yeah. Blanc doesn't just do one thing, it can do these things and the same for Cab. And I yeah. think those three wines have shown that. And I think the, the lineup, well done, big up to you, Jamie. I know you chose these very deliberately. I think you've chosen an absolute cracking um, lineup for tonight um, uh, that really showcases the two great varieties over three different areas of the world. Um, so um, did everyone have a good night? Dan, 
Has everyone said yes? Yeah, hundred oh, percent yes. Phew. They've obviously muted my bits. The first the right time we've been trusted with their baby without oh, them right here, words. and um, I think we I, did I think okay. The first five minutes, we really nailed it. I think we did. Because um, it was like just having them here. I I it? hope. Oh, prices! Well done, Nicola. Danny, let's do the prices quickly. They cost money. They do cost money. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple of um, much more uh, affordable ones, wines three and four. I think the Peter Lehman That's is Bonza. Absolutely exceptional value. Yeah. Yeah, it really Super. is. Um, so there are the prices. Now, um, we have made a little bit of a change. Um, our darling sister company, um, who we love very deeply, um, and where all this craziness first started way back when in 2020, um, Tring Winery is now going to be the hub of all our after tasting sales. So um, in the leaflets, there is a link. Um, I think there's it a is, link. It is there. It is there. Definitely. It is there. I, I can't see it. But That's if you go to tring.wine, um, you will be able to buy all of your favourites from tonight, um, plus plenty of other gems that Jamie and Dan and the gang choose on a regular basis. Jamie's just come back from a... Uh, Italian buying trip uh, this week, so um, that's why he couldn't be is, with is us. Okay? I, I think to, he just is, about is survived. Right? Yeah. I think I, I mean, think he, he needs, coped. Yeah, I, I'm, needs, Jamie, if you if you're watching this or on catch, if you need someone to talk to, I'm here. Yeah, and just and just if talk. you need anyone to take over the next one, because I know how hard it was, um, then uh, you know I'm happy to step in. Um, so yeah, do visit Tring.wine to buy your favourites from tonight um, and any other gems we can deliver all over the country. Um, and that's how we're going to be doing the wine sales from, um, from now. But what have we got coming up? Um, later this month, we have got, so I can't remember. Thing, We've got, of course we have. Sunday the 17th. And of I course know we this have. It's my thing, isn't it? Obviously, it's it's more. It's not World Malbec Day. No, no it's more but Malbec World, World Day. Day. So yeah. I know you've got um, an Argentine Malbec tasting. We have. Up, we've got a masterclass. Which you should be doing because Argentine Malbec. There's a lot more to it than most people realise. Yeah. yeah, and and just a little um, spoiler: they're not all red. Most of them, but not all of them. <gasps> Um, so yes, that's coming up later this month. That's available to buy on the website now. And then next month we are doing a cheeky little drink pink. Yeah, I'm alright. <laughs> and then I think, if I remember rightly, it's California Dreaming, which is amazing. Which coincidentally comes after Alex has been out to California. Very I strange. don't know why. There's a lot um, of thought going I, into this. I'm, I, I'm not comfortable with the amount of thought. I really hope, super. Alex, you're not just having a super lovely time. You're actually going out to do some work somewhere along the trip. Um, don't get your saccharomyces caught in your carcass. <laughs> Remember that. You heard it here first. Anyway, we're going to stop talking. I'm sorry we've taken longer than normal. I but we should call the cab. <laughs> oh! Um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope we've looked after you um, well enough in the boys' absence. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, Lee. Thank, no, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching.